sounding good on it. Play a little bit of that. 
Welcome in the name of the Lord. We're glad that you've joined us for worship at Smith Memorial Presbyterian Church. Our greeting from scripture today comes from Psalm 51, 10, verse 12. 51, verse 10 and 12. It reads, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Well, good morning. Welcome to Smith Memorial Presbyterian Church. It's great to see everybody here. For those who don't know me, my name is Brad Busick. I'm the pastor here, and I've been away on sabbatical for the past three months. And so if you are new to this church, I look forward to meeting you and getting to know you. And if you're a familiar face, uh, I want to let you know that I missed you, and I look forward to catching up. Uh, I do want to thank you all for making these last three months possible and for your patience with new staff and for guest preachers. And I heard that they were awesome. And I thank this congregation for all of your extra work and fulfilling roles that you haven't fulfilled before or doing something that you haven't done in a long time. And uh, you guys are awesome as well. And I also really appreciate those little post-it notes that you left on my office door. That was really neat to come back and see. Um, anyhow, this was a fruitful time for me in which my spirit was renewed and the joy of salvation was restored. And I hope and pray that this was also a fruitful time for you in which your spirit was renewed and your joy in Christ was restored as well. And in the coming weeks, we'll have some time, we'll have some listening sessions where we'll share stories and share observations and things that we learned, both what I learned, but also what you learned, because I'm interested in, in hearing what, what you learned and observed over these past three months. And maybe you got involved in a new ministry or want to create a new ministry, and I'd love to hear about that and help and support you in those ministries. Um, of course, there's a lot that we can share today, but that's going to wait, um, and I do want to go over and talk about some of the regular announcements that we have and highlight some of those. Uh, we do have youth group and children's chapel and Bible studies, and you can read in your bulletins about the, the days and times for those events. Um, I did hear that uh, Bell Choir is starting again this Wednesday, and so Michael, are you able to share anything about Bell Choir? Is everybody welcome to attend? And Oh, yes. Uh, and so by, uh, the bell choir will be rehearsing Wednesdays from 6 to 7.30 here in the chapel. And so if you're interested in that, 
Um, you can see me here at church, at, or it's an open invitation if you want to sit in on a rehearsal. Great. It's a lot of fun. Thank you, Michael. Um, we also have a group called the Outriggers. It's a group of mostly retired folks, but really anybody's welcomed. And they are having a fellowship gathering this Saturday at 4 o'clock. Is that correct? Uh, and they're going to have pizza. It sounds like a youth group meeting. They're going to have pizza and play games. And so uh, anybody's welcome to come, uh, no matter what age you are. And they'll have pizza and board games, card games, and uh, anything else that uh, we need to know about the Outriggers event. But it's basically 4 o'clock this Saturday in the Fellowship Hall. Yes, Barb. Yeah, so people of all ages are welcome to come. Um, and so uh, we have a blood drive coming up September 20, 20th, and we do need a, a church person who's willing to help sit at the hospitality table. So if you're willing to uh, help with the blood drive, let me know. Um, otherwise, please spread the word. Um, giving blood is so important to the community. Uh, as you know, uh, many of you have been recipients of blood donations, and so uh, that is a way we can bless the community. Um, we also always need volunteers at our food pantry. Yesterday uh, is just hit the ground running. I was there yesterday, and um, we served 224 families yesterday morning um, coming to our church for, for groceries. Uh, so we can always use extra help on Saturday mornings for this exciting ministry. And I'll share a little bit more about that because a lot of my sabbatical was spent doing research on churches that have food pantries. Um, finally, I do want to announce that one of the persons who was instrumental in keeping the food pantry going uh, over the summer, our community outreach assistant uh, named Sharon Mutani, she is going to be moving back to Africa. Uh, so her last official day of work at this church was last Wednesday, and so she'll be um, moving to Africa in uh, November, but her work visa ran out on Wednesday. Uh, so next Sunday, we will have a time in which we will uh, celebrate her ministry and give thanks to her uh, during our worship service and have an opportunity for you to say goodbye and to say thank you to her and blessings as she returns back home to Rwanda. Once again, we are glad that you've joined us for worship. Let us begin our worship service with prayer. God of love, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for all of the people gathered here and how you work through each and every one of our lives. Lord, we thank you for this community and the teamwork that is involved in ministry. Continue to embolden us this day to receive your power and grace. Help us to proclaim the wondrous things that you have done and continue to do in our lives and our community. Give us strength and courage to share with joy the good news of your love and your presence this day and every day. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I invite you to stand if you'd like or if you're comfortable for our call to worship based on Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil of the head. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountain of Zion. For in community, the Lord has ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Our first hymn is 496, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms of God. And I chose this because I'm so glad to be back uh, in, uh, in fellowship with, with each of you. So let us sing with joy, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms of God. Jesus. 
seated. <clears throat> and our guest musician is David Kelly, and we have Clara singing as well, and we're glad that they're joined us sharing their gifts. As we sang a song about, oh, what a fellowship and what a, what a joy to be is in fellowship, we also need to acknowledge that living in fellowship is hard. Inter- interacting with human beings can, can be a challenge. And so as we think about uh, entering a time of confession, I remember a, reading a comic from Charlie Brown in which he said, the more I spend time with people, the more I love my dog. <laughs> and so as we enter a time of confession, let us acknowledge that, that we need grace whenever we're uh, with other people, and especially gathering as a community of different generations and different cultures. Um, and as we try to be a community in which we express God's love and care for one another. Let us join together in confession that being in fellowship is, is a challenge and that we need God's grace. So let us pray together a common prayer of confession followed by a moment of silence. Together. Lord, you have blessed us with life. We praise you for this blessing. What we have done with our lives has both delighted and perplexed you. We thank you for your works of love in our community, and we ask you to forgive the sins that have hurt our community and this world. Lead us to love you and our neighbors with the life-giving love of Jesus Christ. Hear now our silent prayers of confession. Amen. For our proclamation of grace, I'd like to read to you from Luke 15, and it connects with uh, churches that do food ministry, but also with any church that does communion when you welcome others at the table. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with outcasts. So Jesus told them a parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. So my friends, know that Jesus even chooses to dine with us. 
My friends, God's grace is amazing and everlasting. So let us now give thanks to that grace by singing the glory to Patri, hymn number 734, Glory Be to the Father. Please stand if you would like. Good to see each and every one of you, and I'm sure you're delighted to, to see familiar faces and new faces as you uh, pass the peace of Christ with one another. Do remember that uh, uh, to please pass the peace in the way that the other person likes to be <laughs> passed. So hugs to those who like hugs, handshakes, fist bumps, or just a simple wave for those who prefer waves. My friends, may the grace and peace of Christ be with you. Let us take time to greet one another with the peace of Christ. Good morning. My name is Sally Heine. I am a member and a past deacon of Smith Memorial. I want to take this opportunity uh, to con congratulate Pastor Brad on his leadership of this church, even in his absence. His influence was felt by his loyal and dedicated church members <laughs> who organized church activities, meetings, event scheduling, guest speakers, Sunday sermons, the list goes on and on. Your leadership as our pastor makes a wonderful, loyal congregation that must make you very proud. I know it does me. And again, we are so glad you are back and looking forward to sharing your experiences. I am now honored to share our scripture passage with you 
But first, let us pray. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open your minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may lead into your truth, touch your will, and motivated to love for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is from Timothy 1, 1 through 5. Paul, an apostle, apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my loyal child in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and our Jesus, Jesus our Lord. I urge you, as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia, to remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than the divine training that is known by faith. But the aim of such instruction is love that comes from pure of heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Blessed are those who hear and what is written in the light of Jesus, the word made flesh. Thank you, Sally. And at this time, I'd love to invite any young Christians to come forward for children's time. And so. <clears throat> okay, so Michael and Claire, what do I have here with me? I don't know what this is. You have a dartboard. I have a dartboard. I love playing darts. And I have a little British dart, kind of in honor of the queen here. Yeah. Um, but uh, the reason I have a dartboard here is because in our scripture passage, we have um, from 1 Timothy, it says that the aim of teaching is love. The aim of teaching is love. And some of you, you're back to school now, right? And you're learning lots of different things and your teachers are teaching you like reading, writing, all sorts of things, right? And, and sometimes, have you ever asked, like, why am I learning this? No. no. Well, when you get older, you might take, like, trigonometry <laughs> and be like, why in the world am I learning this? Or some other things. So I am curious, like, what are you learning? Like, what are, what are some things that teachers teach you in school? And I am going to write some of those down. Let's think. I mean, I'm in fourth grade. Uh-huh. So Teaching you phonics, and that helps you read better? Not really. <laughs> it makes Can it help you sing better? Phonics? As you learn to pronounce different words? I think it could. But it does, it does help reading. It's just, you don't do phonics a lot. So yeah. That's why okay. And are you learning anything lately? Are you just doing math? Alphabet? <laughs> yeah, we've been learning some stuff lately. So some big stuff too. Um, and so what I have learned that in everything that you're learning at school, um, that, that ultimately it's not just to learn math but, or, or learn how to read. But when you learn how to read, it helps you to love other people. Because like when you learn how to read and write, you might be able to write like a happy birthday card to somebody and let somebody know that somebody else cares about them. Um, I was talking to my daughter yesterday, and she's taking driver, or she's going to be taking driver's ed. And like, is it just is the point just to learn how to drive a car? No. When you learn to drive a car, but she can do things that help demonstrate love. She can drive her car to friend's house and, and let them know 
that somebody else cares about them or drive to pick up groceries for somebody or something. And so what I love about this passage from 1 Timothy is that everything we do, every learning we do, really the ultimate goal is to help us to love others. Even trigonometry, which is really complicated math, that can help you build a bridge or a building that is safe and so that other people can feel safe and loved and when they're driving cars around the road or something. Everything that we do is about love. And so I want you to, all of us, to remember that when we learn new things, like think, how can I take what I learned and bless somebody with this and, and help people feel the love of God through what I learned? And so um, let's kind of remember the scripture verse with this. Do you, can you say this with me again? Together, the aim of teaching is love, and that's 1 Timothy 1.5. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for your love and for all that we learn in school and through all that we learn just through the experience of life. And help us to take what we learned as a way to love others and to care for others in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Claire and Michael. So you can, you're going to stay and sing? Oh, no, I'm going to oh, Okay. Okay. You can go to Children's Chapel now. Our next hymn that we're going to sing is called God Be the Love. And it takes words from St. Patrick of Ireland and has adapted those words into a modern song. So please stand if you're able for that song. next scripture reading is from 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 to 18. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not like, be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. 
Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees his brother or sister in need and refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Let me say that again. Let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Will you pray with me? Our Lord and our God, again, it's such a privilege to be here and to worship in your name. We pray in these moments ahead that you would speak afresh, that you would speak a fresh new word to every one of us, reminding us that our true home, our only home is in you, but also as a worldwide community embraced in your everlasting love. Lord, to that end, anoint this message and pour through me the gift of preaching that every child, teenager, or adult who hears this message would have a life-transforming moment, reconnecting with you and with other people To that end, O God, touch and transform our lives, and we know you will, for we pray with great anticipation in the strong name of Jesus, the risen Christ. Amen. Uh, This past summer during the sabbatical, yes, it's a time of rest, but I've also been busy as well. Uh, This past summer, I visited 21 different uh, churches and food pantries while traveling through a total of 17 states. I've been all over the country in airplane and car and ferry and kayak and light rail, monorail, lift, Uber, and taxi. And it's been an amazing adventure. I've learned a lot. And I'm not going to share everything all at once. But first and foremost, I learned that you guys are an amazing congregation, and God is doing a lot of good things through you. Just in terms of physically feeding people, and that's what I spent a lot of time on this this summer thinking about, is that we are actually kind of way ahead of the game compared to some other other church food pantries I, I visited. We feed more people than other food pantries that have several people on full-time staff. Yesterday, we fed 224 households, provided groceries, three bags of groceries, to about 1,000 people in those 224 households. There's only one person on staff who was there. We had 26 volunteers, both from the church and the community, who did everything from packing food, to sorting food, to delivering that food. Again, a thousand people just yesterday morning. That's amazing that we impacted that many people. Plus, I've noticed that we don't even, don't just physically feed people with food, but we give them spiritual food and feed them with the love of God. Through my experience of being at the food pantry and through this church, just in everyday activities, that, that you've noticed when people are hurting and, and you've been available to pray with them when they've come and needed prayer, and you've helped them to know that they're not alone. And so I see you feeding people spiritually as well. So in many ways, through all the things that I've learned, you guys are already doing an amazing job. But of course, we still have a lot to learn and uh, a lot of ways in which we can grow and mature. Overall, I've, in visiting these food pantries, I've also learned that there's so many amazing people in this world. 
So many caring and wonderful people. We're not the only ones doing good things, but this world is filled with good people. And, and you see on the news, and sometimes our, our views are skewed that there's just always bad things going on and bad people doing things. But really, I've just been blown away that, that goodness way outweighs the bad and evil uh, throughout this country. And so I have been touched by people I've met. I've met this one lady in North Carolina named Joyce, who's volunteered at the same food pantry every week for 60 years. And her body is not as strong as it used to be, but she's still there to greet people, and she's just a delight to talk with. And she's passionate about caring for her neighbors in the name of Jesus Christ. Some of these food pantries, I made arrangements to like say, hey, I'm coming over, I'm doing research, can I you know, who should I interview? And some I just walked in the door, like, without any announcement and just kind of observed and then, like, introduced myself. But every single one of them, uh, I was warmly welcomed. And I hope that was true for other people. But I discovered that, really, they are just the most amazing, kind-hearted people, those who work in, in the food pantry uh, areas. And so I learned that there's a lot of good people in this world. I also learned that there's a lot of hurting people in this world. I didn't just talk with the leaders and interview them. Um, I talked with many of the recipients and interviewed them and learned their stories. And most were people just like you. They never expected that they would need to go to a food pantry. Many of them work full time, but their wages are just not enough to make ends meet. They have full-time jobs, but they're hurting. They're hurting financially, and they're hurting in, in many other ways. I met retired folks uh, who are both in need of extra help with groceries, but also in need of just the social life of volunteering as well. I met immigrants who worked for the US military, and they did amazing things in Afghanistan and Iraq, and they've now moved here for their own safety. Um, and they're hurting in many ways, not just needing food, but just hurting, grieving their homeland and how drastically their life has changed. I met someone whose house was completely flooded and they lost everything. I met many people who are mourning loved ones. And often when there's a death in the family, for many families, like it brings financial hardship as well that they have to walk through as well as walking through grief. I met one man who never learned to read, and his wife died a couple weeks ago, and she was the one that took care of all the paperwork in their family. And this man came to the pantry when I was there, and this was his first time coming since his wife had died. And he was really scared about filling out their forms and not knowing how to read. And he was embarrassed that he was a grown man. He's very capable. He's done a lot of work in construction, but he just didn't know how to read. And he was hurting, and he was scared, not only grieving his wife. I met people recovering from addictions. I met people who used to be in gangs. And it was neat to see a lot of these people volunteering in the food pantry, and that's part of the reason why their lives were being transformed. They were finding healing and volunteering and finding a community that supports them and knows them and cares about them in their ups and downs. And I met a lot of people who were lonely. Uh, some people confess that they don't really primarily come for the food. They come because they live alone. And the food pantry is where they can actually talk to somebody and, uh, and they ask how they're doing. And they just need to see another human face. I asked many volunteers why they volunteer, and I hoped that they would say something deeply theological, like, I volunteer because of my faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. And some did say that, but most of the volunteers just told me that they do this because they are lonely just as much as the recipients. They volunteer because it gets them out of the house, and they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. Plus, they said it's a lot of fun. And it's fun just getting to meet people from all different backgrounds. So I did sense a huge sort of spiritual yearning for connection um, that, uh, of people that were there. Again, first, I learned that you guys are great. 
I learned that there's a lot of lovely people all over this country. But I also learned that there's a lot of hurting people. A lot of hurt, hurting people. A lot of people have a pain and a hunger for hope and for comfort and just to know that they're not alone. Now, part of this trip was also uh, this, not just visiting churches with food pantries, but um, visiting colleges with flight schools. Um, as some of you know, my, may know that my son is a senior and he wants to be a, a commercial uh, pilot. And so we visited eight different colleges with flight schools all around the country. And uh, I can talk about those experiences as well, but I do want to mention just one visit um, that we had at one of those schools, especially on this particular day and on this particular subject. One of the schools that we visited was San Jose State University, and we met the chair of the aviation department, and he shared a little bit about some of the hurts that he is experiencing and has experienced in his life and some of his sorrows. Um, this aviation professor uh, still carries the pain of a student that he had and who later became a colleague who was actually the pilot on Flight 93 uh, on September 11th, 2001. And so again, his, his student was the pilot that crashed in Pennsylvania. And as we talked to this professor, you could still see that he's carrying this pain after so many years. You could still hear his, his voice tremble as he remembered. And I know you carry a lot of this pain too. Everybody remembers that day. I know this pain as well, because some of you know that I lost a loved one on September 11th, and she was on that flight, United 93. She was my babysitter growing up. Her name was or in Katuzi Green Colas. And so I always remember her this day. And, um, and I could talk a lot about her, but I, the one story I want to lift up in connection with our scripture passage is before she died, she was working on a book called You Can Do It. And uh, she was a Girl Scout. And she, as she became uh, in her 20s and early 30s, she died in her early 30s, um, she wanted to write kind of a, a handbook for merit badges for adults, thinking, you know, we shouldn't stop, like, doing things and getting active and trying to, like, cross things off our list. Like, I did that, I did that. So her book was called You Can Do It, a, a Merit Badge Guidebook for Adults. And so Lauren was somebody who didn't just sit in the pews. And, like, when she babysitted, we always did something fun. <laughs> it's very active. Um, but she didn't just sit in the pews. She wanted to live out her faith with love and with courage. I did hear a recording of her voice that she left on her husband's answering machine when she was on that plane September 11th. And, you know, she was one of those passengers who definitely did get out of her seat uh, to work with others and, and to do something heroic. She was definitely a let's get busy and do something uh, kind of gal. Now I want to go back to my visit in California. Um, shortly after the meeting with that professor at San Jose State University, in which we felt that connection with some of the hurts and pains that we have in common, I visited another food pantry, and this was by far the largest food pantry I visited over the trip. And this food pantry was a lot about turning faith into action um, and working as a team, as a community. Um, this pantry was called the Cathedral of Faith in San Jose. And boy, they're a busy church. Um, and not busy in a way that is kind of just mere busy bodies doing things that don't really matter, but they were busy actually caring for their neighbors and really making a difference in their community. I visited this pantry on June 30th, and it was by far, again, the, the biggest pantry. It is pretty amazing. It was started by Pastor Ken, uh, their former pastor, 40 years ago. And it started with just a closet and their church full of rice and beans. And now they have 
uh, built an additional building <laughs> to their sanctuary that is dedicated to the food pantry, and they have a staff of five full-time people that run it, and they have, uh, I think, uh, 80 volunteers each, uh, each week, each time that they do it. But before the pandemic, they were serving 200 families a week, much like us, and now they're serving 1,700 families a week, and multiply that by like three or four for how many people that is. Um, the director, Troy Beloka, gave me a tour, and he has the whole distribution down to his silence. They, they bring 10 cars in at a time, and they, feed, they load 10 cars with probably 70 pounds of groceries every three minutes and 20 seconds. And we like timed it and watched all this and it's very amazing and efficient. But Troy did give me some advice in case you're really worried about all this. He said, don't get this big, don't do it. <laughs> don't even think about it. He, he says, it's a little too big. He said, try to stick to like no more than 300 families um, if you wanna be smart. Um, and he said also, Work together as a team. Don't do everything by yourself. Um, yes, you are to be active, and don't just be a team by yourself. You know, work with other pantries around the area too, and, and, and coordinate and collaborate in other churches. Um, but he did remind me of this truth: is be active, but know that you can't do everything. Um, and then I met with the, the pastor of that church, Bishop E. C. Wilson, and he's a, he's a character. Um, and he loves the pantry, and he thinks that it's one of the best things his church has ever done, um, and it's something that he thinks that Jesus wants them to continue doing um, because Jesus loves feeding people, um, and he shared how transformative it has been at that church. But again, he also shared with me that, um, that as the pastor, he makes it a point to you know, show up every once in a while at the pantry, but he can't be there every week. Um, he has to do things that leaders do, and he can't be there every single week. Um, but Bishop E.C. Wilson said that his main role with the food pantry is to encourage people to work together as a community and to make sure it continues to align with the mission of the church. And he joked that he's happy to mingle with people and get to know them, he may occasionally pack some bags and run some errands for the food pantry, but he, he says he draws the line at operating the forklift. Um, he says that's just not his gift, operating that forklift, and so he doesn't want to get involved in that. Additionally, Bishop E.C. Wilson said something that I really liked. I asked him, okay, well, how does Christian discipleship, how is it formed through this food pantry? And he said that, and he said, I believe that one of the most important parts of discipleship formation is for people to see video before they see audio. For people to see video more than audio. He said people respond to video more than audio. He said, it, isn't that what the incarnation of Jesus Christ is all about? The word becoming flesh. The food pantry, he said, is a visual representation of the love of God, and it's more powerful than simply preaching. He said, we're not just talking about God's love. We're not just singing about God's love. We're visibly showing it. Again, our scripture passage today says, how can God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Our congregation is video more than audio in, in several ways and more than just the food pantry. You don't have to be involved in the food pantry. But it is one way in which we are video more than audio. Many of you literally feed your neighbors in, in different ways. You've shown love and concern for people that you know who are hurting and you pay attention to them whether it's calling someone on the phone whom you know is lonely or grieving, you are being a visible demonstration of God's love. When you open yourself up to somebody's pain, when you open your heart to them, and maybe you connect with them, that you have a mutual 
uh, sorrow that you've shared, maybe a mutual experience that has uh, brought hurt into your life. Um, when you let somebody else know that you're not alone, you are being this visible representation of God's love. I know that many of you are active in volunteering at schools. You're volunteering in some neighborhood organization. You volunteer in some sort of service club or fellowship. And that is awesome, and that's equally important. Over the last three months here on this campus, many of you stepped up and did odd jobs for the church. You cleaned out closets. I've walked around, I've snooped around, kind of seen what's changed, and I'm really amazed about some of these closets that were cleaned out. You've uh, created Bible studies. I think that is great that you kind of on your own created a new Bible study, and I encourage y'all to continue to do that. You got involved in roles that, that you've never done before, or at least not in a while. Again, back to the title of my old babysitter, Warren's uh, book. The title of the book was You Can Do It. You actually did it this summer. You did a great job in being active with your faith. Did everything go perfectly? No, of course not. And that's, that's all part of the learning. But we are people of grace. And we are people of grace because God has shown us not just in audio, not just in written words, but God has shown us the, with the visual activity of the life of Jesus Christ that God is a God of grace and love. God has shown his love, not just in words, but in action through the life of Jesus. And that's why we do what we do, not to get new members or to earn any accolades, but we do this because we recognize that there are people in this world who are hurting. And God shows us that we are to follow Jesus into this hurting world. God serves through action, and we are to do that as well. So my friends, let us continue to love, and love boldly and courageously and heroically in truth and in action. Amen. Now, you may have found in your bulletin that there is a flyer about the peace offering. And as we remember September 11th, um, we definitely need peace more than ever. And especially with the type of war that we never imagined happening in Ukraine. The peace offering will be collected th through uh, World Communion Sunday, which is the first Sunday of October. So be thinking and praying about that as we approach World Communion Sunday, the first Sunday of October, with the peace offering. I also want to thank all of you for supporting the ministries of this church during these last three months, uh, not only through your uh, activities, but also through your financial gifts. Um, but like every church through the summer, um, it's typical that financial giving goes down during the summer. So if it is possible for you to write an extra check or, uh, or send in some extra money to help support the operating budget of the church, um, because it, it was a little bit lower of a summer than expected. Um, so please consider doing that as well. But in response to God's love, we're invited to take this moment to reflect on how we might give thanks to God, sharing our time, our talents, and treasures. And so we'll be passing the offering plates down the pews, and of course, by no means feel any obligation to give. Um, but you may also place a blue connect card in there to indicate your presence as well. So at this time, will the ushers please come forward? <laughs>
Oh God, even in difficult and challenging times, you continue to bless us and to blaze forth your love in Jesus Christ. You are with us throughout all of our lives, and all that we have is a gift from you. And we thank you that we are not alone because you are with us. You are with us in all the triumphs and tragedies, all the joys and all the deep pain. You celebrate with us all that is good and wonderful and lovely, and you touch our hearts with healing comfort for all that is heavy upon us. Lord, on this September 11th, as we continue to grapple with what happened 21 years ago, we look for ways of how we might respond. Help us to live by the ways of your kingdom rather than the kingdoms of this world. Lord, protect our minds and hearts from the hatred that piloted those planes of destruction, that we might give witness to the love that defines our God as we participate in your redeeming grace at work in this world, even and especially in the face of evil. Lord, we commend to your love all those whose lives continue to be affected by this tragedy whether it's an investment banker on Wall Street, a family member, a first responder, a soldier who served in Afghanistan, or a neighbor that moved here from New Jersey. Lord, may we hold all of them before you as those whom you gave your image to carry and your son to redeem. So we pray in silence for this country and this world after, as we remember September 11th. And we also have many other concerns in this world in our hearts. There's people in this congregation who have worries about cancer and their worries about their body and what's going on and mysteries about what to do next. Lord, we pray for your healing and your hope. We pray for those who, who came to the food pantry for the first time yesterday and they were scared and nervous and not knowing what to expect. We pray that they have some encouragement to know that they're not alone. We pray in thanksgiving for those who are exhausted and overworked, whether it's at a place of employment or through volunteering. Lord, give us all your rest. So hear us now as we lift up any prayers that are precious to our own hearts as we share those names either out loud or silently. In the name of Jesus, who suffered and died and rose again with new life. Hear us as we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, our charge and blessing is from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 to 13. It says, walk in the ways of the Lord your God. Love him and serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Amen. You're invited to stand if you desire to sing our final song, Wonderful, Merciful Savior.
Thank you. 